I think philosophy is basically the collaborator with all advancing theoretical disciplines. I think the bifurcation that tends to say philosophers, no, no, they just think about the a priori or they're just, they don't take into account anything empirical or anything like that. I just think that's fundamentally wrong. I'm Scott Soames. I'm the chairman of the philosophy department at the University of California, uh, Southern California. Um, I do philosophy of language, history of analytic philosophy, and lately I've been doing a fair amount of philosophy of law. Um, I spent 24 years prior to USC at Princeton and four prior to that at uh, Yale. I got my PhD at MIT. Okay, uh, wonderful. Right. And I, I think I will start with the first question, if the chair is fine with that. And Dr. Soames, uh, I want to talk question. about, yeah, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about direct reference theory. Uh, direct reference theory used to be quite popular in the past. And uh, in the recent times, uh, there have been critics who cite Frege puzzles as uh, a challenge to the theory. Uh, could you expand, first of all, on explaining uh, what it is to the lay audience, obviously, I know, and uh, then explain why you do not believe that Frege puzzles represent a challenge to this theory? Thank you. Yeah, well, Frege puzzles were always the challenge to this theory. And um, the key idea in direct reference theory is that, let me express it this way, what a directly referential expression contributes to a proposition is an object or a natural kind, not some conceptual element that picks out an object or a natural kind. And that means that Hesperus and Phosphorus refer to the same thing and they contribute the same element to propositions, but if propositions are asserted, believed, and known, then it would seem that if you know that Hesperus is Hesperus, you know that Hesperus is Phosphorus. Um, and of course, there are many, many variations on this puzzle. And the question is, what is responsible for the seemingly uh, incorrect results that you get uh, if you combine direct reference theory with some fairly standard conceptions of propositions. For example, the original Russellian conceptions of propositions or uh, the possible world state conceptions of propositions. I think what you need to do is have a different conception of propositions. Is, is one of the things uh, that goes into that different conception, so, some, something you talk about in, in various works, including uh, Beyond Rigidity, is the notion of descriptive enrichment. Is that something relevant to? That uh, is to that? not relevant to the change I am um, alluding to in the nature of propositions. When we talk of descriptive enrichment, or when I talked of it back then, I was thinking of a gap that exists between what you might call semantic content of a given sentence and the illocutionary force of a use of that sentence. Uh, and in that space, uh, pragmatic elements of context can add to or modify the content, which is purely semantic content, to give you a richer content. That was my initial reaction to the Frege puzzles. And that does indeed play a role, but there's a much more powerful role that's played by a new conception of propositions. So you would say that your thinking on how to address these issues has evolved or changed a bit? since then? Or was it oh, definitely, yes. 
Yeah. So, um, Dr. Soames, some would say that if we, um, for example, on Frege puzzles, right, if we are referring to the planet planet Venus as the morning star and as the um, evening star, and uh, the direct reference theorist concedes that the person using uh, morning star and evening star as different concepts um, to refer to the same thing, they're giving up direct reference theory. This is not your view? I uh, No, it's not my view that they're using different concepts. It's My view is they're using the same... They're using different names that pick out the same thing, but it's um, it's not a matter of concepts entering into the meanings of those names, which contribute their uh, Fregean senses uh, to propositions. That's not what's going on. But the meanings are all nevertheless the same, since the reference are the same, right? Yes. So, so then what is it that explains the look, difference? Look, I, I said, power? we used to talk just about meanings, but it's gotten a little beyond that. It's gotten more technical. And, and um, I think our ordinary notion of meaning is really a um, combination of two things that are distinct now in contemporary philosophy of language. And... Um, one of those things is this thing I'm calling semantic content, which is the invariable contribution of the item to the meanings of any clauses that contain it, uh, the compositional uh, determination of semantic content. Um, and the other thing that contributes to meaning or understanding in the sense that we use it every day is uh, a set of widespread presuppositions that are shared by speakers and hearers. In the case of Hesperus and Phosphorus, if you're a philosopher of language, you had to drill it into yourself which one was the morning and which one was the evening. Uh, because if you got that wrong, then you were misusing the terms. So I think anybody who understands uh, the two names know that Hesperus refers to something seen in the evening and Phosphorus to something seen in the morning, but that's not a matter of its semantic content. It's not part of the, um, the proposition that is the semantic contents of the sentence, Hesperus equals Phosphorus. It's something that gets added, and when one assertively utters a sentence, to somebody else using those names, one wouldn't use them unless you thought you, that you were competent to use them and you thought your agent, the person you were speaking to, your audience understood them as well, and you wouldn't be counted as understanding them unless you knew that the one was widely used by speakers to talk about something seen in the evening and the other seen in the morning, and there's a very natural story of how that, that enrichment comes to be reflected in the proposition or propositions that you assert when you assertively utter the sentence. Yeah, so, um, well, actually I actually had a sort of a follow-up on that. Um, when you talk about those two different conceptions of meaning or ways that meaning is used. Um, what would you think to uh, about someone who tried to employ sort of like a two-dimensional framework, sort of yeah, to I've try to capture both that. of those? Yeah, so maybe it, could, it never yeah. works. It never works. I wrote a whole book about that called Reference and Description. And I looked at all versions of two-dimensional two semantics that were available at the time, uh, Frank Jackson, uh, David Chalmers, some variations awesome. on those, and um, none of them uh, actually ended up working out. Could you comment briefly on some of the, some of the issues there in some of those? Uh, it's it's, it's kind of difficult because neither Frank nor David uh, formulated their theories precisely enough to be sure that you 
had them right. So I had to come up with two or three different variations and show that none of them would work. And it's a long, I mean, read, read the book. Uh, Fair enough. In description and you'll find out. I, I can't really go into all the details here. Well, uh, that's fair. And Dr. Summers, we will come back to this, but we have several questions from other viewers. By the way, those who want to get on mic can just DM it. But um, one of those was somewhat of a personal thing. And this is, if you're comfortable disclosing, uh, are you a theist or an atheist and why? Um, I guess if I had to choose one, I would be an atheist. <laughs> and... Um, I don't, don't claim to know that there is no God, but I don't see evidence that there is. And normally I don't believe things um, that I don't think I have evidence for. Okay, uh, fair enough. And, um, okay, so uh, Haiku uh -huh. wants to know, since you are a conceptualist about propositions, do you agree with Plantinga and Lorraine Keller and others that conceptualism about propositions might lead to some divine conceptualism? You have to explain what you mean by conceptualist about propositions before I can answer that question. Oh, Haiku, do you want to come on mic? Maybe he, he doesn't. All right. Anyway. Um, oh, somebody can't. Okay, can't. Okay. So, um, next question comes from uh, the person who wants to ask, what do you believe, uh, what do you think about Wittgenstein's rule-following paradox? As seen oh, the rule-following rule paradox. It has a paper on it, right? <laughs> the rule-following paradox. Are we talking about Kripkenstein or Wittgenstein or both? <laughs> Okay, so we are talking about Saul Kripke's uh, book about Wittgenstein. What are your yeah. thoughts on it in analysis? Okay, this is rather... You have a paper on this, I believe, right? I have two papers, two or three papers on this, yeah. Um, I think there is... Let, let's, say what the, let, let's see what the problem really is. Okay. What the problem is, is that when we use words, uh, particularly general words, predicates and other general words, uh, we take them to apply not just to the particular things of a certain type that we may have encountered, but we think that they apply to an open-ended set of objects or items uh, a great many of which we have never seen or encountered in any way. And of course, the example that uh, Saul uses is addition. And addition, uh, let's just think of addition as a two-place function um, that um, maps uh, arbitrary pairs of natural numbers onto natural numbers. It has an infinite domain. Uh, we've only used it uh, in a tiny uh, number of cases in which we are confident of the results that we get, but we can be challenged by a skeptic who gives us a new case that we've never heard of before and never considered before and asked, we asked whether, as I've used the plus sign in the past, let's say 68 plus 57 is one of the new cases, um, what did it refer to? And I'll say, well, I, I've never thought of that before, but let's see, 68 plus 57, that's 125. And the skeptic will then challenge us to um, justify the answer. How do I know that that's what I had used the addition sign in the past, uh, that I'd used it to pick out a function that computes uh, that sum 
before that pair of arguments. And then we try to go down the line and determine what exactly uh, our understanding of the plus sign was. And the reason it is standardly called the rule following paradox is that you're inclined to think, well, I'm following a rule that I learned. And then the skeptic will ask us to state the rule, and we, he will then raise the same skeptical problem about the symbols that are used in the rule uh, until we finally come to the conclusion, at some point we're going to have to answer these questions without referring to any other uh, symbols, words, um, mental pictures um, that we that themselves require interpretation. Uh, and every answer that we give, uh, we can say, well, we believe that what we were doing was addition, but now we're, or that we used a certain algorithm, the addition algorithm, but now either the addition algorithm is something that needs to be interpreted, or he will ask us, how do you know it wasn't the quotation al algorithm? Um, and at some point, we don't really know what to say. That's the problem, okay? Now, what should we think about that problem? One, pro one thing we might think is, well, we've had certain dispositions to use the plus sign in the past. And those dispositions that we had in the past uh, are the very ones that we've accessed now. And that's why we've come up with the expected answer. But there are a couple problems that you can raise there. One is the question of how robust are our dispositions? And at a certain point, we know our dispositions are going to give out. And the skeptic can raise his problem at that point. Uh, and the second issue is that the question isn't just what we would say. The question is, what is the right thing to say? What is the correct answer? And merely citing verbal, di verbal dispositions without addressing that issue is not going to be sufficient to solve the problem. OK, I'm sorry. That's probably a long statement of the problem. But um, what one wants to say, I think, is we have to unpack the question, what determines the right answer? And that determination relation is a relation that solved strangely, doesn't address. One way of unpacking the determination relation is to think of it as involving conceptual determ determination, some conceptual foundation that would allow us in principle to derive all the results that we need. Another way of thinking about it is to think that the determination relation is the modal uh, necessity relation. And I think that once you take these two things apart, you can hold perfectly well that there is no conceptual relation from any uh, conceptual basis that you will be able to use to um, answer the skeptic. But, you, but that doesn't show that there's any possible world state 
in which everything is exactly as it is with you in this world state, um, but there's a different set of answers. So I think once you <laughs> that, the um, problem gets much easier. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, Dr. Um, Saul Kripke, um, in his first 50 pages of the book on Wittgenstein, when he formulates the problem, some have taken this problem to um, be a counter to behaviorism, and some have even uh, expanded it to be a counter to naturalism. So can you comment on that, and also comment on whether you believe naturalism is something that can still be held in the philosophy of mind and language? Thank you. Naturalism. Can you say a little more about, about what you're thinking of in terms of naturalism? Uh, mind physicalism. So the dominant right. mind physicalist views are uh, functionalism. Um, no, okay. Now you've uh, okay. physicalism. Okay, yeah. I've got. I've got. Yeah. It. Okay, look. Um, I don't think that we have. I don't see that there's any challenge to physicalism. I don't see that there are two different possible world states um, that nevertheless agree on the physical facts, but come out with different facts about the application of words used by human beings, whether it be addition or whether it be talk about the ordinary physical world, our environment, uh, the things around us. There's been no, there's been no challenge to that. The skeptic doesn't create any challenge to that view. He doesn't try to show that there really are um, different states of that kind. Well, uh, on some versions of the argument, though, that you try to show that, um, uh, you know, meaning facts cannot be identified with dispositional facts. That's right. They can't be identified with them, but they can supervene on the physical facts. And if they uh, supervene on right. the physical facts, then they're going to be the same whenever the underlying physical facts are the same. So you're saying that, right, so that's a way to, at the same time, accept his conclusion, but not have to deny it. Accept a version of his conclusion, yes. He right. doesn't make it clear. Uh, right. how we should be understanding that. And I found that quite striking when I read it, because where did I learn to make the distinction between, um, you know, conceptual of sort, sort of a priori versus modal necessity? I learned it from him. Uh, and yet, whatever it was in 1980 or 81, whichever that book was, he wrote as if, uh, he was oblivious to that distinction. Now, it's true that he was reporting how Wittgenstein appeared to him when he read it. He may have been reporting an earlier stage in his cognitive development. Fair enough. Um, so sort of on a related yeah. note, I just had a quick question of um, whether you have any opinions on the normativity of meaning and or content. And I could expand on that if it's unclear the question. Yeah, I do. Um, how can I put this? The normativity of meaning and or content. Um, let's, let's talk about things like assertion, belief, uh, and so on. Um, those relations that we bear to propositions expressed by sentences are truth normed. That is, there's something wrong about believing something false. There's something wrong about asserting something false, and so on. So there is a certain normativity that's based on what those attitudes are aimed at. 
it's a, I think there's, what I think is assertion and belief are normative. Uh, but there are plenty of other, uh, there are plenty of other notions like doubt. I doubt that so-and-so. That um, propositional attitude is not truth normed in the sense that if you doubt something uh, that isn't true, you've made a mistake. Or I dreamed that so-and-so. Or I imagined that so-and-so. Those aren't truth normed. And yet we use the same sentences uh, as expressing propositions that can be objects as, of those attitudes as we do the truth normed attitudes. And so I think that the normativity that exists, exists in some of our cognitive attitudes, not in the notion of meanings of sentences that express propositions that can be objects of the attitudes. So, right. Um, so could you clarify what uh, the truth norm is uh, exactly? Is well, it you shouldn't. All other things being equal, things. you shouldn't assert th things that are false. All other things being equal, you shouldn't believe things that are false. Why? Well, I think because belief has a certain function and, assert and assertion has a certain function, um, different functions, of course, for the two, but they don't serve their natural functions, if you will, uh, and I'm fine with that. Um, uh, when what you assert or believe are propositions that are false. I see. Um, Dr. Soames, Durr would like to ask you a question on microphone, if that's fine. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, so thanks for doing the same. I, I had a sort of a general kind of historical and looking forward question for you. Um, yeah. It seems like there's been a lot of shifts in analytic philosophy about how we understand modality. There was a time when certain very sort of conventionalist views where you reduce modality to linguistic convention or some sort of conceptual notion were popular. Uh, and then after Quine, you had people like Kripke, you had Lewis, who, who kind of took the exact opposite view. Yes, um, it seems Right. And it seems like nowadays um, there is and this could just be my um, bias here, but it seems like more people are start, starting to move more to sort of this what Cider calls postmodal notions where people like Kit Fine and Cider think that we've kind of exhausted what modality can do. And so we're moving into a time when we're not going to rely on it as much. And for instance, Cider is also some sort of neo-conventionalist. And I know you personally are somewhat against um, this sort of linguistic reduction of modality. So I was just curious if you think, um, that if you're noticing any sort of shifts in contemporary analytic philosophy with respect to modality. You know, I, I don't think I have followed that all that closely, so I don't know how much my uh, weight my opinion should have. I find the notions of, you know, modal necessity and possibility, I find them quite intuitive, but I also am puzzled about them. I'm puzzled about what the source of our intuitions or convictions are concerning these notions. And I'm thinking that they are certain kinds of explanatory notions, maybe this has something to do with Kit, what Kit's talking about. But when we explain things, we have a sense of, we explain the less fundamental in terms of the more fundamental. And that raises the question of what we mean by fundamental. Um, and that may be part of what you're talking about. If it is, I think it's a very good thing to be investigating. Uh, it sounds like we should be raising these questions, but I really don't have developed views on them. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, uh, Dr. Soames, there was also a couple of, um, I guess, trivial from your perspective questions but that people were interested in, so I'm going to ask them in no particular order. So uh, one of the first things uh, about your view about metaphysics, uh, Platonism or nominalism, and why? I have no sympathy with nominalism. Uh, I guess, I guess, I think there are such things as properties. I think they are ways that we can, either things can be, or at least we can coherently imagine them to be. I don't identify them with any uh, materialistic construction. Um, I do have some unusual views, I guess, about some properties, uh, both properties of individuals, like being red, for example, and properties of pluralities, like being scattered around the world, or maybe better, uh, being three, being three in number. Um, and I think that in a certain sense, we can actually well, let's talk about red. How, let's talk about red versus being three or being three billion. Um, somehow mathematical knowledge has seemed to present, as has been thought to be far more difficult to explain than ordinary perceptual knowledge. And Maybe that's true of a fair amount of mathematical knowledge, but I don't think it's true of our arithmetical knowledge. So I think that just as when I hold up three fingers, uh, I can see that they are three without counting them. Uh, so when I look at, I don't know, a copy of my book, uh, Rethinking Language, uh, mind and meaning, I can see that it's orange. Um, so, if that's a version of Platonism, then I'm a Platonist. Okay. And somebody wants to. So, oh, go ahead, the church. Uh, yeah, I had a, a somewhat related question, not really, about uh, natural kinds. Now, you yeah. are certainly a, a realist about natural kinds. Could you. Yeah. Maybe. Briefly expand on what flavor of realism you prefer, like what uh, sort of account of natural kinds you have in mind. I don't really have too much of an account of natural kinds. Um, I think, I guess, the thing I'm inclined to think is that, um, is that um, their properties, and that they are properties, uh, the presence of which explains a lot of other aspects of the things they are properties of. Um, and I'm inclined to think that there, that properties, let's say species or substances um, or, well, colors or things like that. I think color is a natural kind too. Um, are uh, two properties of that same type are identical if and only if uh, they share all possible instances. Um, so I guess I think they're coarse-grained explanatory properties of a certain kind. 
Fair enough. And uh, uh, probably could preempt the answer to this, but do you have any sympathies at all for more like, conventionalist views about uh, natural kinds? Well, I don't know. Tell me about it. Well, the, the, the basic idea that um, what things we count as natural kinds is really a result of various conventions we have in carving up the world, but there's no no, Neil I don't. I don't, I don't think that there's a there's a good book out which talks about that among a bunch of other things by one of my former Princeton students, uh, Mario Gomez Torrente, uh, published just last year, I think, and I've done a re short review and I'm doing a longer essay on it. Uh, it's called Roads to Reference, and he has a very nice. Uh, very nice conception that I guess I would adore, endorse. Sorry, how do you spell that name? Mario Gomez, G-O-M-E-Z, dash Torrente, T-O-R-R-E-N-T-E. -E. All right, thank you very much, got it. Um, Dr. Uh, Elms, some interpretations of your work have um, applied the label of essentialism to you, and this view has been controversial from the beginning. Uh, how do you respond? Well, first of all, could you give a rationale for why you would subscribe to so-called essentialism, and um, how do you respond to the most common criticism directed at it since the times of Plato? Thank you. Or at least I, I didn't get the last the last part of what you said. The common criticisms, and then you said something. Oh, the common cred criticisms that have been directed since the time of Plato uh, at essentialism. I, I, maybe I'm not aware of which ones you're talking about. Uh, essentialism seems pretty obvious to me. Not, I guess the best criticism I know of is that we have, I think, fairly confident essentialist intuitions about a great many things, but we are, we feel ourselves very much in the dark about a great many more. Uh, and why is there this range of things that we are so, um, so much in the doubt about? I'm not myself in, I don't feel myself in doubt about, say, my desk here that I'm sitting at as I talk to you. I think uh, that it's made out of, it, and its history has been that throughout every part of its history, it's been made of certain collections of molecules of a certain kind. And I think that anything that wasn't a collection of molecules couldn't be a desk, couldn't be this desk. Um, so that doesn't seem to me to be I don't see why that should be controversial. Uh, and there are a million cases like that. Uh, but there's a lot of features of, like, how much of this desk has to be the way it is in order for it to be this desk. And that is very open-ended. It's not that I think that it's easy to pick out lots of essential properties. I just think it's very hard to deny that there are any. What, what if someone responded that, well, maybe we could have that same desk even if it were, I don't know, gunky all the way down. Right? Yeah, could I be a plastic credit card? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> presumably that, that is an example that wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, Detroit, did you want to go ahead? I had a couple more questions, unless you want, uh, but it was on a different topic, so... Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll just get through one of the things. Um, Jack, if you uh, wanted to, that would be like best if you got on mic and presented the common objections to essentialism. Is Jack here? Does Jack uh, object to essentialism? I'm not sure. I can go. Who, are, who, are we, who are we saying? Who are we talking about? Oh, Jack. Uh, he's a uh, critic of essentialism. Anyways, um, so uh, we had a, another trivial question. To, well, what could be seen as a trivial question. Uh, in the philosophy of mind and language, do you hold to content internalism or content externalism, and why? Well, 
I think you can believe singular propositions, uh, so I've got to be an externalist. Seems obviously that we do believe them. Right. Um, well, that actually, I just had a question from uh, Professor Norwood there. I was wondering if uh, you were assuming trans world identity or what you think about trans world identity. Oh, God. First, I think <laughs> identity is, well, wait a minute, something's happening to my screen. Just a second. Okay, are you still with me? Yep. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, trans world identity. Um, well, I think all it amounts to is, you know, um, necessarily uh, Hesperus is phosphorus. Okay. If if some if A is B, then and A and B are directly refer referential terms, then obviously the proposition is going to be equivalent to A equals A. And yes, of course, that's necessary. Now, trans world identity, if all that means is that there are possible states that the world could have been in, but isn't, uh, but the world isn't in, in which I didn't have this difficulty today uh, speaking to you to get the microphone uh, to work, then yeah, I believe that that's a possible world and that if that world were actual, uh, I, I, not some twin of me, um, I wouldn't have had that difficulty. I don't see why anybody would doubt that. So the, you're affirming some notion of trans world identity in the sense that... Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's, it's mostly a pseudo problem. Um, Dr. Soames, Dur would like to ask a question on microphone. Uh, Dur, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. This is my second question. So if anyone else wanted to, you know, feel free to stop. But uh, it, I, instead of asking like, a very specific sort of like metaphysical question, I was just curious, I guess there's two parts to this question is, um, the first is the sort of meta philosophy question is what do you think um, philosophy is just in the business of doing, which I know is a very difficult question to answer. So, you know, uh, that could take a long time. But also, I was kind of curious what you thought of, if anything, of continental philosophy. Uh, okay, I can say something about both of those, I think. Um, what I think about philosophy is it's a thing that people have asked me a lot lately, uh, basically because I just had this book published in 2019 called The World Philosophy Made, in which I go through the history of Western philosophy, uh, substantial parts of it, and try to indicate the enormous contributions to the way we live and the way we think and just about all parts of our lives, our science, our religion, our economics, our morality, um, our political systems, and so on. I think philosophy is basically the, the collaborator with all advancing theoretical disciplines. I think the bifurcation that tends to say philosophers, no, no, they just think about the a priori or they're just, uh, they don't take into account anything empirical or anything like that. I just think that's fundamentally wrong. And I think that when we look at, you know, some of the great philosophers of the past have been, um, have been uh, scientists of various kinds, some of the great scientists, Newton himself was very philosophically minded and half of his, not half of, certain part of his stuff was philosophical. Galileo, that's true of Galileo, and it's, it's true of Einstein. Um, I think when you look at 
mathematics and you look at Frege, uh, Gödel, Tarski, Church, Turing, I think they're all mathematicians and philosophers. Uh, if you look at Adam Smith, Adam Smith was one of the great founders of economics. Well, at the same time, uh, being a, you know, holding the chair in uh, moral science at Glasgow and, and having written a uh, theory of the moral sentiments, which he thought was his greatest work. Um, and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. Um, Hume himself, you go back to the dialogues on natural religion, and he articulated in embryonic form in response to the design argument, uh, the rudiments of what became Darwin's theory of evolution. And by the way, Darwin's grandfather studied with Hume and gave Darwin himself the works of Hume and urged him to read it. Uh, this, this just happens all over in philosophy. We are not bound. Uh, by, you know, some conception of, oh, well, only a certain type of thought is philosophical. I think what, what happens in philosophy is we come across problems that can come up anywhere in life, and we tend to gravitate toward cases where progress is capable of being made, but something is, paradoxes are presenting themselves, uh, some, something is blocking, some kind of conceptual limitation is blocking advance, and philosophers step in and help to reconceptualize the solution space for these problems, expanding it, and helping progress to occur. So I'm, I'm thrilled with philosophy. I, I think the idea, I mean, for a while in the analytic tradition, there were these doctrines about what philosophy had to be. Okay, and other doctrines have existed in philosophy about what it had to be. And they were all far too narrow. They were just one part of the story. As far as continental philosophy goes, and I've mentioned analytic, one of the funny things is in the, you know, mid 20th century, the early 20th century, there was supposed to be, there was, I guess, this divide between the analytic uh, philosophers who had their own kind of, for a while, uh, school of thought about what philosophy had to be and what it couldn't be. And the Continentals were on the other side and they had different ones had, had views about what it had to be. And it's as if at that time, if, if you were living at that time, you might think the great you know, current of Western philosophy had split into two irreconcilable parts. But I don't think that was so. And I think analytic philosophy, at least, has matured and has the real the real effect of analytic philosophy is not to have turned its back on anything in the tradition that led up to it uh, but to add new elements to philosophy that were not primary parts of philosophy having to do with language and logic and um, the study of science itself uh, that were not as central to philosophy as it has come to be. They've now come to be among the main parts of philosophy. So it's expanded philosophy as far as continental philosophy goes. I mean, Husserl was a natural outgrowth of Frege, and people beyond Husserl were further from uh, people in the analytic tradition. But, you know, people like Habermas and, and what they talk about in terms of political philosophy is certainly something that can be compared to, 
I guess you'd consider him an analytic philosopher, or John Rawls. Um, so I don't think there's a fundamental discontinuity, but I do think analytic philosophy has matured and expanded and connected with philosophy that preceded it and all the way back to the beginnings of Western philosophy. It's, it's clearly one of the mainstreams of philosophy that have come to us from the very beginning in ancient Greece. I don't think and uh, continental philosophy has been as vigorous and has charted its future in a way that makes sure that it does have a future and does connect with the other things that came before it. Thank you. So, yeah, so just kind of as a, I just want to, on the first reply you gave, would this be a fair characterization of, of some of your thoughts there that, well, on one hand, what counts as, you know, being in the domain of philosophy is dynamic and somewhat vague, and also that, um, well, philosophy as a d discipline and, and, and collection of problems is in many ways continuous with other intellectual disciplines and problems. Is that something you would agree with? With that, I didn't get the last part of what you said. That uh, that philosophy as a as a discipline and uh, as a collection of problems is uh, largely continuous with other intellectual disciplines and and yes, I, I do think that's true. And and we have so many more intellectual di uh, disciplines now that there's much more for us to be continuous with. And this is right. an interesting challenge to the way in which philosophy is studied these days. Um, if you're doing philosophy of physics, for example, a lot of people now who do that have PhDs in both. Uh, and if you're doing philosophy of economics, you may have to do that as well. Uh, there are, you have to master a great deal of technical material, but you have to master a lot of philosophy at the same time. Um, there are other areas where that's really not so true. Like I said at the beginning, you know, in the last um, decade, I guess, I've been doing more and more uh, philosophy of law, and I never have a law, I did, don't have a law degree, and, you know, uh, I haven't written as much in that as I've written in the other things. But you can. That's an interesting thing. You can, you can enter these other areas and make a contribution and begin to interact with them at a high level. In some disciplines, it's like law, it's much easier than in others, um, like physics or other branches of science. But look, I, I mean, I think the same thing is going on and will expand when we talk about even something like ethics. Um, I think ethics needs to be interacting with people who can, uh, you know, sociologists and uh, biologists and psychologists who might be able to tell us something about the nature of, about human nature, the nature of our species, the nature of our cognitive and emotive capacities, and the needs that any social organization will have to uh, take into account. I think there's just enormous room for all of that. I mean, I think this is how we've organized our curriculum now our undergraduate curriculum at USC. And so we have a regular philosophy major, we have a philosophy, politics and law major, we have a philosophy, politics and economics major, and we have a philosophy and physics major. And if we can get the right uh, faculty, we'll have uh, ethics and the philosophy of the health sciences as a major. And we've gone from 100 majors 
uh, a little more than 10 years ago to 300 majors uh, wow. right now. And I think more philosophy departments should be doing this and more philosophers should be finding ways to make philosophical connections with companion disciplines. And that, that sort of diversification of like specialization and, and, and major yeah, stuff is- Yeah, it is, it is. You, uh, specialization, that's, that's right. Um, we will have, but we'll have a lot of different kinds of philosophical specialists, but they don't have to be only specialists. Most of these people have a certain, I mean, they, they're familiar with the history of philosophy and they have the ability to talk to the rest of us. So it really is possible. All right, so we'll move on. We had a question, uh, Quick Brown Fox wanted to ask in uh, NBC. So, if you want to... Quick. Oh, hello? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, Professor uh, Soames. So, uh, I know you've characterized two dimensional semantics as mischaracterizing um, Kripke uh, in some of his arguments. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, I know you've written this a little bit in your book, 2000, uh, 2005, book reference description, but could you explain exactly what the mistake of Chalmers and Jackson is with this? Oh, well, there's more than one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with, uh, well, sorry, go ahead. Do you know, do you know uh, Chalmers' conception of strong necessity? You that, mean secondary intentions? Oh, uh, yes, no, no, no. something whose primary... No, 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 I do not mean that. Um, his notion of secondary, at least his initial notion of secondary intentions, was the same sort of conceptual uh, apparatus as primary intentions. It's just that we got two different ones. And, but he has, even after he presented it, the rudimentary idea of that in his first work, what was that first work called? Can you? Components of Content or Conscious Mind? Yeah, the conscious mind. <laughs> That's what. And, um, but then he has a notion of strong necessity, which is a fundamentally different kind of necessity. And, of course, that's what Kripke was wanting to do, uh, to, to appeal to. Now, there's an argument he gives. And if you look in my book, you'll find it. Uh, I don't have that book in front of me right now, so I can't tell you where, but it's in one of the several chapters on Chalmers, uh, in which I talk about the argument that he actually gives. And he, the, the conclusion was, if there were this other kind of necessity, the kind that some people, like me and like Saul, thought that Saul was trying to get at, um, then it would be impossible to know which propositions were uh, necessary in that way. And that was just a flat mistake. That was probably the worst mistake. The other, uh, the other problems were theoretical problems, like can you really do the work that we want done in the two-dimensional framework? And I, I gave a variety of arguments that you couldn't. But that was the fundamental conceptual mistake. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just pointing you to where you can find it. Right, right, right. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking specifically about this one example, about Gödel. So the example uh, I've seen Chalmers Jackson say is that, and I, I, re I read some of your chapter of your book you talk about too, where the idea is it turns out that uh, Gödel and Schmidt, yeah, I know. Gödel yeah. didn't prove the Inclinus uh, theorem. Sorry, yeah, Joe did, right? Yet we know we have we can know right now that a Kripke's argument seems to imply that we need to have some knowledge, right, of Gödel, such that the description, even though it doesn't apply to him, we still think that our our utterance of Gödel refer to Gödel, not Joe, right? Um, right, right, right. And and people like Chalmers and Jackson seem to think that that means you have to have some kind of narrow or epistemic content. Right, so how why, would you? Why does it? Why does it mean that? 
I don't understand why. Why are we supposed to draw that conclusion? We know that Gödel is a name, and it's gonna. We're talking about the same guy. We're stipulating. We're talking about the same guy. Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm using the name to refer in this scenario to the guy I'm actually referring to when I talk about you know 1929. So. You're saying that you can know, uh, you're just stipulating that you're referring. I'm not stipulating. I know what I'm referring to. Just like I, I know right now I'm referring to Saul Kripke when I say Saul. Am I stipulating it? No, I'm actually doing it. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's all I had. Um, if I may, uh, Dr. Soames. Uh, we had a couple of questions, and I, I think I can formulate it okay. Uh, just related to Frege puzzles again. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the example was um, when we refer to uh, Muhammad Ali and K Cassius Clay. Uh, if somebody were to say that uh, Mr. Ali is not uh, Mr. Clay, uh, on your view, would that be a contradiction or a merely a misinfor misinformed opinion? This, you're raising an important point, and I'm going to answer it this way. When we talk about propositions, things believed, things asserted, and so on, if somebody were to ask us what we're talking about when we use this word proposition, things we believe and assert, well, they would be things like that the earth is round that uh, London is pretty, that London isn't pretty. So what are, what are we basically assuming? We're assuming that there is such a thing as the proposition that so-and-so. And what I want to suggest is that there's more to propositions then what is represented as being what way? The earth is represented as being round. Uh, Ali is represented as being clay. Uh, and if we have a notion of propositions which allows them to be um, cognitively distinct, even though they're representationally identical, the same things are said about the same things, uh, but they're nevertheless cognitively distinct, we have a vast new opportunity for solving Frege puzzle problems, whether they involve uh, names, whether they involve natural kinds, whether they involve first-person cognition, whether they involve present tense cognition, whether they involve cases like uh, Russell tried to prove logicism versus Russell tried to prove that arithmetic is reducible to logic. There are so many versions of these puzzles, and these puzzles arise from thinking that all there is to a proposition is what objects, what properties, what properties or relations are predicated of what objects. And if that's what you think, you're not going to get any satisfying general solution to Frege puzzle problems. And that's why we need a richer conception of propositions in which they are certain cog a rep purely representational cognitive uh, acts or operations. And the important thing about identifying them with acts is that acts have the right identity conditions. And we need those identity conditions, act types. We need those identity conditions in order to solve Frege puzzle problems about propositions. So, what do I mean by the same identity conditions? In the case of acts, we can say, you know, consider the act traveling to work. 
consider uh, the act driving to work and consider the act walking to work. In each case, the same guy, me, let's say, gets to the same place. And when I walk or drive, I also travel. But I can travel without either walking or driving. And we can, we can do that same kind of individuation for Frege puzzle propositions and make a huge amount of progress. All right. Um, uh, quick, did you want to follow up on that last discussion or, or, or not? Um, okay, I just... My only, uh, I guess, last question, Professor Soames, about the cryptic girl thing is, so how, how do you know that Joe that isn't the same person as Godo, given that Joe completed the uh, proved incompleteness theorem? Because we set up the case in such a way. How did we set it up? We said, uh, you know. Girdle uh, stole it from Joe. Well, that's part of the setup that Girdle is there. That's right. Part but, of the story. But wouldn't that show it? Because that means that there's something that there's some descriptive content that Joe, Look, has, that Joe doesn't Girdle have. It. When I stipulate a possible world state, I don't, I'm not just saying, oh, these properties are somehow instantiated in some way by people who knows who they are. We better get a good telescope so we can look at those possible world states and see who's instantiating those properties. No, we take elements of our world, properties we're familiar with, people we're familiar with, and we stipulate that those are the worlds we're talking about. Sure. Um... I don't have to figure out whether... You know, who is Joe? Who is Gertle? No, that's part of the stipulation of the world. Any more than I have to figure out what, what I'm talking about when I say something's red in a possible world state. Sure, but I think you bring up a good point, which is that Gertle has a certain description that Joe doesn't satisfy, which is Gertle stole the incompleteness theorem, right? He's yeah. the one who stole it. So that would imply that there's that's how you can make that distinction, right? There is some narrow content that Joe... The goal has that uh, Joe doesn't satisfy, right? Well, in that world, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, that's all I have to say, I guess. Um, oh, oh, one thing I should say in response to one of the questions uh, about propositions and so on, and I said about the identity, when you utter a sentence, you're asserting a bunch of propositions. Standardly, and which ones are the salient, important ones? That's a question for context and and communication. But you're just as when I'm when I'm um, driving to work, I'm also traveling to work, and that that same kind of uh, it's not like which single action where you were performing, you were performing both. But, but it, it, in a given discourse, one or the other may be more important. And that's what happens in our talk about propositions. Um, Dr. Uh, Soames, uh, we don't know how much more time you have for the AMA. Um, would you like to keep going for a couple of more questions? Uh, I can go a couple more questions. We sh probably shouldn't go too long. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so we will probably go on for 15 more minutes. That's not too much. Uh, Danny would like to ask his question on microphone. Elaborate on the difference between uh, a reductive identity versus a non-reductive identity. Um, maybe, I, maybe that's... Unfair. I don't know. I have any idea what you mean now. Tell me. Well, I, I, and that's kind of what I'm asking is when... When we say that X reduces to Y, do you take that to be an identity relation or are you, I mean, I just don't, I just want to draw on your knowledge of the literature at this point. Yeah, my knowledge of the literature is probably not great. Um, so, but the way I think about it is 
I just, you know, there's a weak relation, supervenience, and there's a strong relation, reduction. And reduction basically defines the higher in terms of the lower, whereas supervenience doesn't. It just says, given that you've got the lower, there won't be a change in the higher. All right, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. What are you guys interested in? What kinds of philosophy? I mean, all of you guys, do you have something in common? Are, there, are you more interested in one type of philosophy rather than another, or what? Um, it's pretty Most wide people ranging. here are, are interested in theology only. No, no, no. <laughs> there is some interest in that, but it's pretty wide ranging. Uh, religion, philosophy, mind, philosophy, language, philosophy of action. Um, well, Politics. people like the have different interests, obviously. Like, so, some people just want to know, you know, stuff like, we don't have to get into it right now. But yeah, we're interested in all sorts of stuff. Well, and, uh, people who are interested in theology, if you're interested in, uh, for example, Thomas Aquinas and some of the medieval people, read chapter two of my The World Philosophy Made. Oh, that's great that you wrote on Aquinas. Yeah. Are your comments on Aquinas uh, positive in general? <laughs> I think he's one of the great philosophers. I read him in graduate school at MIT along with others. Cool. Um, oh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I just had a um, question about... Um, this so in, in your book, uh, Philosophical Analysis in the 20th Century, um, you discuss, among many other things, uh, you know, Quine's arguments against the analytic synthetic distinction. Yeah. Um, and I think it's in chapter 16 or 17 where you um, suggest that maybe the best response might be to deny that um, analyticity, necessity, and a priority are related in the way that, that Quine assumes. Uh, could you comment briefly on this, or do you recall it? Um, um, well, yeah, I mean, it was a dominant thought from, I don't know, when it, I think there, there were hints of this in Russell in our knowledge of the external world in 1914. There were indications of something like this in the Tractatus. And then during logical positivism, it really had a heyday. The idea that um, philosophy was concerned with what's necessary and what's possible, and that these are conceptual problems, basically, problems of a priority. And then what did we have in the 1930s? Um, we had the linguistic theory of the a priori. And the idea was, of course, that everything that was necessary is a priori. Everything that's a priori uh, is analytic. So uh, meaning is the source of modality, as you might put it. Now, what, what was, do you remember there was a Quine article written in, I don't know, about 1935, um, and it was called what? It was called Truth by Convention. Right. And it was a nice attack in a way, very, uh, you know, there's really one central point in it, and it was a good point. Uh, in my mind, that was the best uh, paper he ever wrote. Um, and he, but his conclusion was uh, that he rejected a priori. And he, uh, and he very, sh not long after that, came to reject necessity too. So in a way, he was on the same page as Carnap. Uh, and others in the Vienna Circle. Um, but he just went, went a little further and said all of these 
uh, you've got to you've got to get rid of all of these. Now, so what was he? What was what was he putting in place? Um, Quine also has a has a paraphrase of something from Carnap, um, which basically has the message that um, philosophy of science is philosophy enough. Uh, and what we see in, in Quine's basic outlook was an attempt, really, to construct a kind of global scientific worldview. Um, and what did that worldview entail? Uh, it entailed the rejection of meaning in the sense that we ordinarily understand it. Then in ontological relativity, it included the rejection of reference as we ordinarily understand it. Um, and this, I argue, uh, I guess it's in one of those chapters or both of those chapters, several of those chapters, um, that this led to a problem for Quine in that he had to reject so much that it's not clear that he had sufficient resources left to, um, to make sense of the starting points in his arguments and indeed even to state his theses of physicalism or to adopt a conception of truth other than Tarski truth, uh, which was way too weak for anything that you could use to state uh, earlier versions of his indeterminacy thesis and, and um, inscrutability theses about meaning and reference. And so I believe he got himself into such a reductionist corner that it became self-defeating. Um, and this was a good, uh, self-defeating in the sense that you could not even state the problems that led him to the position that he came to uh, using those positions as premises, uh, which means that his system self-destructed. And we had to have a different different kinds of modality. We had to have a conception of a priori in which it was not simply analyticity or truth and virtue of meaning, knowledge of truth and virtue of meaning, and we had to have a different conception of necessity. That was, I think, the basic picture. You know, it's hard for me to remember. It's been like two decades since I wrote that. Wow, you gave a pretty good uh, recollection of it from what I Good explanation there. Thank you very much. Um, did anyone else have any questions in the chat? Did you see any? Uh, Canadian? Yeah, there's a couple that were DM to me. I guess um, one of the ones that um, we were concerned with, and feel free not to answer, was uh, what happens to be your height? So many people were so interested in this as a trivia, but if you do not feel comfortable answering this one. What happen? What happens to be my height? Yes. How tall am I? Yeah. Well, it's been a while since I measured, but um, I know I was once five feet ten and three quarters inches. But hey, wow. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be surprised if I was a little less now. Oh, he, wow. he phrased it that way happens to be because it's a contingent fact. Well, yeah, I mean, his, his being 
Uh, five, ten yeah. recourse is not an essential. I think that is contingent. Property. I don't think one of my nests, I am an essentialist, but I don't believe that's not one. So, yeah. so you're above average, Dr. Phelps. Yeah. I mean, if you shrink yeah. below that height, you'll cease to exist, I think, since it's one of your essential properties. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. No. And, uh, Dr. Oh, you know what? You know somebody who is shorter than you believe, than you would think? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Did you know that? Oh, he's six foot one. Oh, no, he's not. Maybe not now, but he used to be six foot no, one. No, he didn't. I mean, I was at USC. He and I were in the president's party to, for a football game. He sat, I sat with my knees in his back and stood with him uh, next to him, and he was shorter than me. I don't know what he's wearing to be six one, but he wasn't wearing it then. <laughs> That's amazing. It's an amazing story. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So uh, before Detroit wraps, uh, before you go, a uh, couple of more questions that we wanted to ask. Um, any particular thoughts on Thomas Aquinas's proofs for God? Something like the cosmological argument, the uh, fine tuning argument. I don't have any particular, uh, you know, things to say about them. The one I spend most time on, or what, what, what I talk about most, I, I don't really focus so much on the argument for God in that chapter. Um, I talk about... Uh, his conception of the soul and the immortality of the soul and the role it plays in the immortality of persons because he was an Aristotelian and he believed that we were combinations of form and matter. Um, and the immortality of Socrates would have to be the immortality of Socrates the man, not simply the soul of Socrates. And so I was interested in exploring a bit the relationship he thought existed between, um, between the soul of a person and the person, and indeed how the soul could be immortal given that he was a, an Aristotelian about form, uh, whereas Aristotelian uh, forms uh, cease to exist when they are not instantiating any matter. I mean, I, that, that struck me as quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, if what, one of the great things that Aquinas did was he offered a framework that would make, allow... Christian theology to have the resources of Arist Aristotelian metaphysics and indeed um, all of Aristotle. And I think this played a great role in the development of Western civilization. I'm not convinced what he has to say about the soul and the body and all of that. But I think his, his structure basically says that you can be Christian, you can believe in revelation. There's a lot, however, that you can prove uh, by ordinary means, and that Christianity, this religion with this message of the meaning of human life, and of the purpose of human life can coexist with the most vigorous applications of reason and even of observation of the natural world and the beginnings of uh, progress in natural science. The fact that faith and reason could come together at that time, I think, was an extremely important. Oh, and um, yeah, and we will move on to the final question. Uh, and I after that, we will just all right. 
Oh, sure, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I was just, I was just gonna. I, we don't have to spend too much time on it if we want to wrap it up pretty soon. But I just had a question about um, your views and the and the philosophy of mind and just sort of generally and maybe what you thought about like a uh, Kripke style argument against identity theory in specific. Yeah, well, you can look also, you can look in chapter nine of the world philosophy made for that. Uh, but I've just had a, I'm in the midst of a dispute with my former colleague, um, Sean Burgess. I really reject the, the Kripkean argument. I think it's a mistake. And, but I go further. I, I, I think John thinks that's probably not a good argument too, but um, I'm attracted by functionalism and John really doesn't like that. Um, and um, it thinks it leaves, he thinks it leaves out, you know, experience or experiencers or, uh, you know, something different. And um, I mean, that's about all I have to say about that. I'm not, I mean, I tend to be, a physicalist, but it's it's not an official position of mine. I, I haven't argued for it, um, and I could be wrong. It could be that there is a, there is a mind and a body, and they do interact, and uh, there are different substances. Uh, I don't see the need to posit that, but John thinks I'm missing the most obvious facts about personal experience. All right, and uh, Canadian, you said you had one more question to go through? Yeah. A quick, uh, quick wanted to know, and again, this is something personal, you can choose not to answer. Who did you vote for in 2020 elections? Well, you can guess who that was, and I will <laughs> leave it to you to examine all the evidence you have in front of you and come to your own conclusion. I see. Um, thank you so much, Professor Solms. Uh, this was a pleasure, even though we didn't have the best of starts, given our technical problems. But I think since then, this was amazing. I hope you've had a uh, great experience. Uh, thank you so much for coming on here. Um, yeah, that was fun. I like talking to you. Um, now, is this, what happens to this thing we've recorded? Uh, this will be put on YouTube. Um, if you want the link sent to you, uh, we can yeah, just send me well. the link so I know where it is. And also, yeah. I, I know we've we've mentioned a few of your books in the course of the discussion. But if there's anything else you want to mention or plug, you could you could do that now if you want. But yeah, uh, no, I don't think we need to do that. Yeah. Okay, no, and uh, hope hope uh, you know uh, you will become more accustomed to Discord. There's a lot of philosophers. That, well aside from us, I guess, that frequent um, platforms like these. And, you know... Uh, and this particular platform? Yes, this particular platform, um, you know, there's m multiple servers. You know, this is just one of them. Unfortunately, yeah. it's the one that's destroying yeah, every other have, currently. But, yeah. Like, we have Russia uh, Orlando coming on next week, and Graham Priest, and uh, others that have been on and will be coming on. Yeah, I sent him videos of our previous videos. But uh, Dr. Soames, once again, this was a very pleasurable experience for us. Uh, we hope the feeling is mutual. Yes. Uh, and uh, we will thank not burden you any further. Thank you for answering all the questions. Uh, with well, honor. thank you. We, we managed finally to get on. That was the real yeah. check. Okay. Thank you so much uh, once again. Yeah. Uh,